Welcome to another episode of Animator Interviews. My name is Evan Vernon. I'm a contributor at Animation for Adults, as well as Animation Nights New York, or Annie for short. For those new to Annie, we are a monthly screening event and yearly festival that celebrates the very best in animation talent. Our artists come from all across the globe, and many have gone on to have their work featured at Cannes and other prominent festivals. Our next screening is scheduled for Sunday, March 21st, and will take place on the Annie website. Attendance is free, and films will be available from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Time. We've had an exciting year so far. Our guests have come everywhere from California to as far away as England and France. Today we're going to switch gears a bit and interview someone local. John Morena is with me now. The New York native is well known for his experimental style in award-winning shorts. His work has been featured at the prestigious Annecy Film Festival, as well as at Ottawa, Zagreb, and Anima Mundi, to name just a few. John's short film, The Creator, will be featured at Annie this month and constructs an abstract but deeply personal portrait of John himself. A figure sits blindfolded in a room, shooting arrows at a light bulb, but missing over and over again as time continues to pass. What does this film mean, and why is it so personal to its director? We come with questions, and we leave with answers. Today, John has kindly agreed to chat about the film, its context, and his philosophy as an artist. John, thanks again for joining us. To start things off, tell us a bit about your journey. What got you into animation? I sort of had a lightning strike uh, epiphany when I was 18. I was in college for, uh, and for illustration, and um, I suddenly got a bug in me that I wanted to make movies, but I still wanted to draw. So animation made the most logical sense. Uh, I applied to uh, SVA and I didn't get in the first time. So I switched schools and uh, uh, got my grades up and then I ended up getting, getting in there. I didn't graduate there, but I ended up starting a, a production company with two friends and then kind of fell out of out of animation for for a long time. Uh, eventually, I got back into it. It's a it's a long, boring story, but it it, um, it took a few years for me to get back into animation. You cite multiple influences on your website. Did you have any figures in the industry who kind of inspired you to apply to SVA initially, um, or just to become an animator in general in your early years? Not really. I just kind of just picked it out of thin air. I have to be honest with you. It was mm-hmm. like a, they were. I would say more at that point, my uh, influences were more figures in music. Uh, but as far as filmmakers were concerned, there were more live action filmmakers like, you know, Stanley Kubrick, Martin Scorsese, people like that. You know, I didn't, I wasn't specifically drawn to animation school because of like Bill Plimpton or something like that. I mean, I had known of him. I was a fan of, um, you know, um, anime and like the MTV stuff that was going on at the time, liquid television and, you know, there wasn't much. Yeah. It's not like now where it's all, where it's just everywhere. You know, back then there was still like 13 channels on television. And, you know, if you had cable, you, you were able to see MTV. And that's where animation outside of after school animation and Saturday morning cartoons was. Yeah. Yeah. But the fact that you decided to enter the industry of your own volition without any sort of outside influence is also inspiring in its own right. It was John Morena's idea. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. So thanks for kind of giving us a little brief overview there, John. I'd like to go ahead and ask you two questions. So the creator is one of your films that's being screened at Annie this next weekend, the 21st. I understand it was part of a larger project called Area 52, which was a very ambitious attempt to make 52 shorts in a year. So that's one short a week, basically, um, Mm -hmm. which is astounding. So John, if you could, Give us some background um, on Area 52. Where did the idea come from? What inspired you to take on such a challenging task? And then maybe tell us a little more about the creator and what sort of um, inspired that short specifically. Well, uh, Area 52 was born out of uh, fear and frustration, actually. I had gotten into um, the film industry, really, to make films. And as most of us do, we get swept up in the whole, you know, commercial 
thing. And, you know, a lot of my film work was working on other people's stuff. Um, when I had left the production company that I had started in 2014, uh, I had to, uh, I had, was just thrust into freelance land and, um, you know, basically started back with nothing. I had to build a client base and all that stuff. So Mm -hmm. by the time I got the bug in me that I wanted to make films again, this was around 2016. And this is me like, you know, starting to push 40 years old. And I hadn't made any films. So it was either now or never, you know, it was like, if not now, when? So I remembered this um, idea that I had had called Area 52. This was a few years before I had left my company. And um, really it was just supposed to be um, in in its original form, which is supposed to be these weekly tests, weekly experiments to try to find uh, new and original, or at least new to me, um, animation techniques and uh, visual effects techniques um, that would then inform my client work. But I, the thought of doing all that work just to do a couple of cool tricks with some bullshit television commercials, like you know, really, um, uh, kind of sounded a little bit like hell. So I decided to pair my want to make films with this Area 52 idea, and that was kind of how that was uh, off and running. I also, you know, one of my things with Area 52, because this was an Instagram project, Mm -hmm. um, I had no um, ambitions for anything really beyond that. Um, It wasn't like I was making them and like wanting to get into Sundance or anything like that. I just wanted to bring my stuff directly to the people. And um, instead of bringing it to YouTube or Vimeo, I brought it to Instagram where really there was really not much else like it going on on Instagram. Typically on Instagram or Facebook, people will put up a sample and say, okay, click the link and then go somewhere else to watch the full thing. But I only know of one other show. It's called Blark and Son. It's a puppet show that Mm -hmm. uh, was actually giving full uh, start to finish episodes. Um, Theirs was a television show. Mine mine was films. You're able to watch full films right there in the feed. So I thought that that was an enticing idea. Yeah, you you briefly mentioned that a lot of these films were uh, featured in prominent festivals. I I think several of them got picked up um, at Annecy and about 25, correct me if I'm wrong on that, are currently being distributed by Autour de Minuit, um, which is a very boutique French distributor. Yes. I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that it's quite astounding what you accomplished through Area 52, John, because, you know, you think about how labor intensive this was to produce one short per week. If it were just an everyday man attempting a feat of this kind or an everyday animator, a lot of the content probably wouldn't be that good simply because you're forced to come up with something original um, over and over again so quickly. But that wasn't the case with you. The films were phenomenal so much so that they are being distributed internationally and celebrated on an international scale. So um, I really just want to commend you for that. Thank Um, you so much. Appreciate that. Yeah, absolutely. Especially since I almost died or, or, you know, at least it felt that way. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I I did read the video description for the creator and it sounds like this particular short was kind of born out of that frustration. I mean, Mm -hmm. you yourself are a creator and I'm not sure if the short itself was, maybe some sort of metaphor for your frustration at that point, because I think you were about a little past the halfway point starting to get fatigued. Did, did you want to elaborate well, on that? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, that, that film was uh, originally a self portrait and it was um, originally called uh, originally called area 52. Uh, mm-hmm. I've since changed it to the creator because the name of the broader project was Area 52. I don't want people to get confused. Um, but yeah, that's uh, exactly right. The At that moment in time, um, you know, when you're sort of fishing for these ideas, at least when you're really trying to do quality work, um, you know, they're not easy to come by. And uh, that film and other films before and after it have taught me that, um, you know, when, when you feel like you're really running out of ideas, um, you should dig deep for the honesty. And yeah. that's just where I was at that moment. You know, you're feeling like, well, this is a self-imposed prison. You know, I, what my, I had to sacrifice 
you know, obviously I couldn't like go out on weekends and, you know, I didn't really see my family all that much. You know, another notable thing was that I, I had spent Christmas Eve with my family, but I, I spent Christmas day by myself working on a, working on a film to get everything done. Uh, this film was done, I think towards near the end of the summer, you know, and, um, you know, people are outside skipping around eating ice cream and, you know, having a great time. And, you know, here I am, uh, making these films and you start to wonder if like even anybody cares or if, you know, there are a lot of times where you are the only one who actually cares about these things. So I guess it's just a, uh, an expression of the fact that, um, you know, it's, it's torture, <laughs> you know, that's kind of probably the best way to, best way to put it. Cause it's filled with bet with a lot of self doubt. Um, mm -hmm. you know, there is a loneliness aspect to it, but you know, in, in, in the end, if you keep trying, you're gonna you're you're obviously going to get an idea. Um, a lot of them come out of thin air, but a lot of them, you know, come come from you really have to uh, find it and beat it over the head. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing, John. And I appreciate your vulnerability too. You know, you, you talked about the frustration that comes not only from encountering this writer's block and struggling to produce or finish your next idea, but also how you feel like your work often goes underappreciated and that can be discouraging. My, my brother's an artist and struggles with the same dilemma. I, I personally think that at the end of the day, you know, take this as you will, if a work of art touches so much as one person, then it has merit. You know, if it means oh, something definitely. personally, then it still has merit. So I really hope that you continue to do what you do and share your voice. So thank you so much for sharing. I really do appreciate it. One thing that I thought was particularly fascinating about the Area 52 project is every single short was right around 60 seconds or less. You seem to have this penchant for uh, micro length content. I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit about why you chose to uh, make your shorts so concise. Was it just because of time constraints or was that a deliberate artistic choice that you were making with these films? It was both. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I didn't really have any other choice, honestly. Just the, mm -hmm. I, was, I, I was a slave to the technology. Um, uh, Instagram didn't have IGTV, was not a thing yet. I don't even think stories were even a thing yet in 2017 or they may mm -hmm. have just become a thing then. So uh, really the only way to watch video there would be in the feed and you're limited even still today to uh, 60 seconds. So that seemed really enticing because, you know, those are films that you can, you can actually get done. You know, just from working in um, commercial world, uh, you know, you can, you, you can get a 30, 30 to 60 second um, animated spot done within a week. Um, you know, I know that might sound ridiculous if you're doing it in a very traditional fashion, drawing and mm -hmm. you know, the whole um, pipeline um, aspect of it. But if you're doing stuff in After Effects and if you are um, resourceful, it's, it's definitely doable. Thank you so much for sharing, John. I did want to ask you a more broad question about animation as a medium. Um, I understand that your initial background is in fine art. You were initially educated in fine art, not only interested in it before you went to SVA. So I, I wanted to ask you if you could to elaborate a little more on how you see um, animation as a medium. Do you also consider animation to be fine art? Is that what you're striving to accomplish through your work? Yes, I see uh, animation as fine art, even though the rest of the country generally doesn't. You know, I mean, I think other animators do to a certain extent. I think that there are large swaths of animators that don't. Um, I think that their periphery stops uh, at the major studios and major networks, television shows, Rick and Morty, wow. things like that. Like to, to them, that's the extent of uh, animation. But um, when you leave the United States, you see that these countries have a really rich history mm -hmm. in a, um, you know, I suppose it's a more fine art approach um, where it's not just the thing for children and it's also not just narrative work. Um, you know, I believe that that is the fault of the monopoly of uh, major studios and major networks. You know, to, to answer the second part of the question, yes, I think that it, um, I, well, you were asking about if, um, if I strive with my work to, to make it, to make it so, or to make it so that it is, so that it can be seen as fine art. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just one guy. 
So like, just cause I see it that way. And maybe a few others see it that way. Like I'm, you know, it's just like anything else. There's an echo chamber. So other people who are generally attracted to it, you know, may also like it. Um, you know, the audience for the, for the things that I do is small. There is an audience, mm-hmm. but it's small. And, you know, again, just getting back to the, to the studios and networks in order for it to, to be what you're saying, it, it, it would require a full scale about face from the major studios and major networks where they'd have to say out loud on things like social media, television, radio, their own subscription channels, where they'd have to openly admit that there's more to this animation thing than they've been presenting to us. Mm-hmm. And then they'd have to put their money where their mouth is and spend millions of dollars marketing it. And it doesn't make any logical business sense to do it. Yeah. They, they, um, you know, they uh, require, or, you know, most of the things that you see would have, would, would not be seeing the light of day if it wasn't able to be merchandised, you know? So just, I mean, I, I think most independent filmmakers would agree about their own work, but just speaking on behalf of my own work, you know, they can't parlay what I do into toys, dolls, games, clothes, Mm. oven mitts, aprons, bed sheets, pajamas, baby diapers, bibs, shot glasses, birthday party napkins, coffee mugs, every single knickknack, trinket, and tchotchke under the sun. You know, you could print this uh, name of the show, the film, or the character onto it. You know, which is sort of a sad state of affairs, but that's just how it works in this country. And because of the bubble that we live in in this country, um, we think that the way we do things is the best way. And uh, so, you know, we're not really exposed to a lot of um, stuff, a lot of a lot of really great foreign animation, which has, quite honestly, a much more diverse and more rich history than we do. You've made a lot of really interesting points there, John. So thank you so much for sharing. I absolutely agree with you. You know, as as much as we might love the major studios like like Disney and Pixar, it really is, as, as you more or less stated, a, a commercial echo chamber. You don't see studios um, taking the same risks that you'd otherwise see um, with films in France, you know, whether that's due to a lack of public funding for film or maybe just different cultural attitudes that we have here in the States. But what it is encouraging to see is artists such as yourself expressing themselves with short form content like this. I think that some of the most not only experimental, but expressive and artistic animation that I personally, at least, and I think many people have witnessed in America, tends to come from freelancers and independents such as yourself. You know, whether or not you can financially capitalize on that is is one matter, but one thing is sure, and that's that you are, for the people who care, keeping that ethos alive and encouraging a culture of of, of celebration, one that actually takes the medium seriously and approaches it the same way you would a fine painting, poem, or piece of music. Sure, um, sure, so what yeah, you're doing I, really you know, is- like, um, I, think, I think like in order for it to, you know, just to expand on what I was saying before, like it, mm-hmm. uh, in this country anyway, as long as, in order for it to reach at a mass level, besides um, the major studios informing everyone that mm-hmm. there's a thing such as, you know, all the other stuff that, you know, we haven't been showing you, it would need to become a trend, which we're a very trend oriented society here in this country. And, you know, um, it's just hard to uh, imagine a world in which, um, you know, underground independent animation could cohabitate with really big time commercial slick uh, children's stuff. I did want to ask you before we run out of time, uh, one last question here. Yeah. So area 52 is, is finished. People can access, I think most of the films on Vimeo right now, um, possibly Instagram too. You have a current project in the yeah. works called films for no one. Can you give us a, a little brief on, um, where you are with that and, um, uh, yeah. what inspired you to, to pursue? So, uh, films, films for no one is, uh, an anthology film. It's uh, going to be feature length. And when I say feature, I mean, um, according to the Motion Picture Arts and Sciences Academy guidelines of 40 minutes and for 40 minutes and up. Uh, so um, shooting for about 45, 50 minutes. Uh, 
uh, and it's going to be another collection of short films. I'm calling them like regular size short films, mm -hmm. uh, which would be anywhere between two and 15 minutes. And uh, there will be a bunch of micro shorts as well. I'm attacking it sort of the way a band would attack an album. That's sort of what it is. It's, a, it's an album of films instead of an album of songs. Um, when it's done, you'll be able to see it as a full feature. And also you'll be able to see uh, some of the uh, self-contained shorts as shorts. So, so like singles. And right now it's in uh, pre-production. I have no deadlines. I'm taking my time. It's sort of the complete opposite of Area 52. It's not, a, it's not like this um, marathon at a sprint pace. It's a marathon at a really leisurely pace. Yeah, that sounds really interesting, John. And we uh, look, look forward to, um, to seeing it when it's finished. Thank you once again for your time. Um, for all those listening in, if you would like to watch The Creator, it's going to be screened at Annie's March screening event next uh, Sunday, March uh, 21st. The film will be available from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern time. We'll also have virtual mixers from 3 to 5 and uh, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern time. In the meantime, if you'd like to support John, you can always follow him on Instagram or Vimeo. Uh, we'll include all the pertinent links in the details. John, uh, once again, really appreciate you coming here today. You do have a special voice, so all the best to you. Thanks, man. Me too. 